Oh, what are we gonna do when we get back? Oh, what are we gonna do when we get back? I take a shower and hit the rack. I take a shower and hit the rack. Welcome to Charlie Mike. If you're a combat veteran with an entrepreneurial bug and want to know what highly successful combat veteranpreneurs are doing to transform their sacrifice and experience to create their visual reality, then this is dedicated to your inspiring and fulfilling future. And now your host, Dwayne Perrell. Invest in Yourself ebook is my free gift to you for listening to the show and becoming part of the CO Nation. To receive your free gift, please go to landmarklifecoaching.com. Thank you for joining us on this episode. There are so many veterans with the core strengths to become successful entrepreneurs and continue to make a huge positive impact on our country. Here we highlight the amazing success, successes of combat veteranpreneurs. Combat veterans for the purpose of this, of this show are soldiers, sailors, Marines, and airmen who have served the United States in wars, campaigns, and in theater on foreign soil or hostile waters. Our guest today is Daniel Alaric. Daniel was born in California, moved to the Chicago area when he was a child. He joined the United States Army right after high school. Daniel met his wife and got married in 2008. He and Elizabeth had their wonderful son, Ethan, a year later. Daniel transferred to the reserve shortly afterwards to be with his family. Upon exiting active duty, Daniel wondered how to continue the pride and patriotism that the Army provided. Daniel decided that wearing your pride and patriotism on your back was the best way, and that was when Grunt Style was founded. All right, Daniel, welcome to the show, and thank you for being a guest. Oh, thanks for having me. Excited to be here. Yeah, I'm excited to have you on and uh, share your experiences with our listeners. Um, I've been following, you know, Grunt Style for some time now, and your your other uh, ventures, Alpha Post, and uh, some other stuff you guys have going on that I'm sure you'll get into. Um, but before we get into your uh, amazing entrepreneurial background, can you give our listeners a quick history of uh, your military experience? Sure. Uh, joined the Army Reserves 2000 right out of high school. I didn't want to go to college. I just didn't want to go to. Uh, I just didn't want to go to business like everybody else. You know, you go to college, you get a degree, and then you go to work for somebody else, and then you die. And you don't do anything uh, that matters. I wanted to serve something that was greater than myself. So, um, you know, and I was still trusting the waters that maybe the Army was the right answer. So I joined the Reserves. I uh, enlisted as a uh, signal support system specialist or whatever it was. Um, and I did Camo for a bit and I uh, got deployed almost right away, right after 9-11 for uh, about two years uh, over in the Balkans and then came home. Uh, um, then I was a personal trainer for a bit and then I uh, got to switch over to the infantry side and then I was a drill sergeant down at Fort Benning from 2008 to 2011. Um, and around that time is when I started the business as well. And then I, uh, after I got out of uh, drill sergeant duty, it was, I joined the Illinois national guard and, and I left that last year. Awesome. So you actually started into the entrepreneurial realm, uh, before you transitioned. So that, that was a part of your effective transition. Uh, that, uh, well, I knew I had to get out. So I got reactivated as a drill sergeant, uh, after I started the business. So I had, didn't really have much of a choice. <laughs> so, but, uh, the uh so that that extended that stay but um the yeah i mean I, my wife asked me to get out um you know i was gone for a while I had a brand new wife brand new baby and she's like hey it's time to come home <laughs> and um you know she stayed in chicago and i was down at fort benning georgia training uh, infantrymen and and i didn't know really what what does a infantryman drill sergeant do on the civilian side and i just I was struggling to connect the dots, and I didn't want to leave the military. I love the military culture of pride, patriotism, and whatnot. I mean, there's a lot of days you want to forget, but, you know, there's a lot of days that you never want to forget. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so we all have those, and uh, I choose to take the the best days with me, and I wanted to share that with others. So that's where I came with the idea of Grunt Style is share that pride with other people. Yeah, that's that's interesting. I've read some of your uh, information online of how you got started. You know, a, a lot of people, you know, are concerned with jumping into the entrepreneurial realm because it's not 
there's no guarantees, you know, but not that there's much guarantees even in a, a standard J-O-B. Um, but, you know, even less, you know, when you are trying to build the business yourself and things are lean and you're trying to get known and prove, prove yourself in a potentially new realm uh, of, of prior, you know, other than what you've been known for in your prior uh, experience. And so can you can you kind of ex- kind of give us a, a feel for what it was like when you made that first, you know, that first venture out into that after after leaving the military? Oh, gosh, I didn't I didn't know what I was doing when um, starting business. So uh, I literally uh, Googled at one point, what is business? Because I just I, did, I didn't know. I mean, why would I know? I didn't have any experience. I didn't have much of an education. But um, it was a lot of hard work. I read a lot of books, um, a lot of more audio books. Um, you know, I'd go through, you know, four to six books a month, um, talk to whoever I could find that was smarter than me, which is, you know, that's a pretty long list. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, the next three years were, were miserable. I, I always had at least one or two side jobs and, um, that the, the time that I work, wasn't working those, I'd pack up my car and throw shirts in the back of my car and just travel around the country and sleep in my car and you know, whatever I could do to make it work. Wow, that that that's a great story for people to hear because you know it's if if you're passionate and it's a you know and if you're purpose driven with what venture you're going into, th- those are the trials and tribulations that will make you successful. You know anybody that's anybody that's been out there around the veteran community has got to have heard of grunt style by now uh, it's, it's amazing what you guys are into where your logos appear uh a lot of things that you guys have going on now and that wasn't overnight like you said you know there was a lot of you know you know just getting by and making it work and learning as you go because as an entrepreneur that's the thing you're never going to know everything you need to know before you can truly get into it, you've got a, you know, one of my uh, mentors, you know, one of his favorite sayings that he says is you got to fire the gun and ride the bullet. And that sounds like what you did. You know, you, you just got to fire that gun, ride the bullet and, and, and where it goes, it goes. And, you know, networking with people, as you mentioned, is, is extremely important to being successful. So, you know, what was kind of a turning point, you know? So, so you said the first three years were, you know, were the, were the, you know, the testament years where here it's either going to work or it's not what what do you remember a point where you kind of felt like you had gotten that foothold to say okay now 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 i have you know a little bit better vision and or um direction of you know feeling like like this is going to work yeah no absolutely um it i didn't recognize it at the time but i i remember being asked this question probably two or three years ago and i'm like yeah you know what there was a point in time and it just made so much sense and it was 2012 and we were probably going out of business for the 12th time or whatever <laughs> and uh my wife looked at me and she's like hey babe it's not working she's like let's shut the doors and uh and and i said okay i i agree with you but we have our first trade show coming up in a few weeks it's in Las Vegas. I think we can do very well at this. And she's like, okay, well, we'll quantify what is very well. I'm like, we can do – if we do $6,000, that's a sign from the heavens that we should keep our doors open. She's like, okay, great. And I'm like, awesome, thanks, and you're coming with me. So uh, we're uh, – <laughs> we were never poor, but you know, usually we were very broke, if, that, mm-hmm. if you can kind of understand the difference. Mm-hmm. Uh, never, you know, Barely had enough two pennies to rub together, but we uh, – we, Packed on it, it, we flew standby on like a Spirit Airlines budget flight and sat in the sat in the back next to the bathrooms, I'm sure. And uh, so we land in Las Vegas and uh, we walk. Uh, we take the free shuttle of the hotel and we walk to about a mile, mile and a half to the nearest grocery store. And we buy a loaf of bread and a jar of peanut butter, and that's nearly all we ate for the next two and a half days during the show. We just didn't have any money. And um, she put on a tight T-shirt and walked around to the the the, the different people at the show and try to bring them back to my booth and I'd try to sell them. Say, hey, buy our great products. Um, told them what we're about and what we stand for. And, and that's what we did for the next two and a half days. And after after that, we jump back on the plane. She passes out because she's exhausted. And I start tallying up all the receipts. And if you remember, we needed $6,000 to make it work, keep the doors open. And we made, and it was like 6200 bucks. It was just enough to be really depressed about staying open. <laughs> yeah. Like, you made that that goal, but yeah, <laughs> right. And I was like, man, and, and, I, and I, I don't know if I said it out loud, but I had this, you know, huge, huge. Uh, I just wanted to yell. I'm like, why is this so freaking hard? And 
I just couldn't. It didn't make any sense. I'm like, how are these other people doing? I'm like, there is no. I'm, I'm a pretty average dude. I work very, very hard. How is everyone else being able to manage uh, and get their business off the ground and be successful? What am I doing wrong? And so I pull out a yellow legal pad, drew a line down the center um, uh, vertically, and I wrote down on the left side, I wrote down everyone that any business I can think of that was more successful than me. And again, long list. And then regardless of industry. And then I wrote uh, on the other side of it, what were they doing that I wasn't? Um, and and that's that was kind of our turning point right there. Is, and is, it's, it's not that I wasn't humble enough before, but it's, hey, you, re- there, you can't walk into business thinking that, it's just going to happen and all your dreams to come fruition. It's a lot of hard work. It's a big grind. And the, 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 the big unknown is the things that you don't know. Um, you, you don't have a, a formal education walking in there. You're going to pay for it somehow. And it, you need the years of experience. You got to learn from somebody who's already done it and, and what they're doing. So, um, I used that moment and that from that moment, I mean, I think that month when we did like $8,000 total, right, in, in January 2012, by December that year, we did $64,000 in a month. And at that time, that was a lot of money for us. I mean, that was life-changing for us. I'm like, oh my gosh, wow, we actually have something substantial. Now we're bringing in 60 plus thousand dollars a month, We've, you know, and it, it was great. And we were able to bring on a few extra employees that can help us ship orders and get everything prepped and everything like that. And that's really when we started turning around. Now the learning profit process never stopped and you have to continue evolving every single day if you want to continue to grow and expand. But that the same philosophy still stands is um, learning from your experience, learning from others' experience and always trying to see what's around the bend. Yeah. yeah. Some great points. Um, so you know, I got to imagine I've not been in a product based business before myself. There's probably a huge learning curve with understanding the distribution channels and who do you go to to get your shirts, you know, the actual shirt itself made regardless of what's printed on it. And, you know, is it overseas? Is it is it stateside? You know, understanding the whole sales uh, channels for effectively being able to do that and keep your cost down is, is got to be quite a quite a learning curve in itself. No, absolutely. So, um, we actually do all our screen printing here in our building. Um, we got about 306 people in our building at a, in a 24 hour period. We run three full shifts. Um, so we do all that here. Uh, we do our own design, our own, our, um, sales, customer service, marketing, uh, media. We do our own screen printing. We do some stitch work. Um, we even, uh, the PVC patches, we make those embroidery we fulfill ship everything everything's in house wow that that's impressive too because you know a lot of a lot of people they pretty much outsource everything and then you know because of costs and and being able to bring in the talent and and i think probably the most amazing thing i i like about your business is that these are veterans that are able to do this and the camaraderie and the environment because I, I i deal with a lot of veterans that are in transition with my with my coaching practice and you know the big thing that that we all miss when we transition is that camaraderie those people that have come from the same cloth that come from the same culture that get what we get and so you know having a community of those as an organization is is got to be pretty it's i got to imagine that that the internal culture is pretty phenomenal now um it's it's like a family sometimes we're you know having a beer giving each other high fives praising each other sometimes you want to throw a fist i mean it's just like <laughs> the service you know, you know it's exactly that i mean mm-hmm. sometimes you you love uh you want to punch that team uh, member right next to you, but you, if anyone mess with them, you, uh, you're taking them down. So, <laughs> and sometimes it's like that. You know, we have an incredible team here. The culture is fantastic. It is a high stress environment. We're growing very quickly, and uh, it's. I'm very, very proud of our team, and 100%. That's the reason why we're here today. Is we have such a phenomenal team members, and it's very similar to what you see in the military. Our corporate structure is uh, like a battalion. Um, we have three companies and a headquarters. Each company has their own kind of mission and structure, uh, but we have platoon leaders, uh, we have squad leaders, team leaders, etc. Awesome. Yeah. And that, that's that's a great thing to be able to carry over as well because, you know, the familiarity, it takes away the mystery of how do I operate? How do things move up and down the chain of command? You know, how do I get how am I effective as an employee to get things done? 
And so you, you take away those distractions of trying to learn a new system, learn a new structure, things like that, where your employees can come in and just they know what they need to do. And, that, and that's their head down focused on, on, on meeting your mission. And so that's that, that's a great strategy in itself, because, you know, other organizations, they're trying to they're trying to help all these people who came from. Uh, different organizations, different sizes, different places, different cultures, different standards, and they're trying to meld them into a team. And it's really like the it's like the pickup game for uh, kickball, right? It's like you you, you kind of pick the who, who you think is the best, and then try to get them to work together. And that it's a lot of distraction, and it, it you know some make it through the process of that, and some don't. And so the turnover costs the company money in itself. Um, so. You know, um, I noticed you guys had do a lot of uh, marketing as well of your of your business um, at a pretty high level. Um, can you know? I've noticed you guys are doing the MMA stuff. Uh, I saw the NASCAR car that recently ran, and you know, so obviously that you probably have have discerned that a good part of your customer base is in those markets. Um, how how do you make a large decision like that to to market at that level, right? That's not just putting a, a flyer out or putting, a, you know, the typical social media advertisement out or something in a paper or on, online in any form. That, that's, pretty, that's a pretty significant decision and investment by the organization. At what point do you know as an entrepreneur that you're ready for that level of, uh, you know, commitment to market? Yeah. So when you're starting off in any type of product based business and sometimes your product is your service or whatever, um, if you're starting off, you don't need a marketing department. You don't need marketing functions. I mean, you obviously do branding, but raising your brand awareness should just be you talking about your brand. You don't need marketing. You need sales. So everything you do has to have some sort of direct sales correlation because you can't afford indirect marketing because it's too risky because you don't know what you're doing. That's a, so set that aside. So as you continue to grow, you've been selling, you know, one on one, talking to people, getting email addresses, whatever. You made sales, and now you can start establishing your brand with marketing. Now, for to make a big investment in, let's say, a NASCAR, you want your own NASCAR. Well, there's you know three different levels of NASCAR, and depending on you get the driver, you have to get the team, and the, and the, and you know how much money you want to invest in it. It could be a few hundred thousand dollars to a few million dollars uh, every year. It's a big investment. Um, so the way we have to discern that outside of the normal, obvious decision-making process, you know, should we do this? Do we have a market there? Do we have, or do our fan, are our fans there? Can we reach fans? Um, so after you do those obvious decisions, the last one is, well, okay, is this something that we should do? And the way you determine that is more of a risk aversion. Um, if this, if you make that investment, let's say you spend a quarter million dollars on an entry level NASCAR, right? Um, and if that 100% flops, the driver gets killed, money, right? Worst case scenario, and it doesn't affect your day to day operations, and you can continue to grow, then it should be okay to do it. Mm. You don't. There are no hail marys. You, um, you're. It's it's business is a ruck march. It's not a sprint. Um, you want to go 20 miles, you can't. You gotta scream down the road. You know why? Because your whole platoon has to get there with you. Yeah, you might be fast, you might be big, and you might be strong, but you still need those machine gunners behind you, and they have to come along. And everyone has to go at a very strong, steady pace. Nobody falls out. And if someone drops out, guess what? You still have to carry the load. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that's some really interesting information because, you know, I, it, it's and I, and I only ask these questions because, you know, I think people are going to see the amazing success that you guys have achieved as an organization and think that it's kind of, you know, there's some logical path and there's some easy, easy, uh, easier made decisions along the way. But I think what you're relaying, you know, is true is, you know, it's still a hard decision because, you know, it goes from, oh, should we run this $250 ad as a startup to should we invest $250,000 potentially and, you know, maybe not get a return. So um, it's the stakes just, you know, kind of grow as as the success of the organization grows. So that's 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 really key for our listeners to hear, because, you know, it's it's really if you know, if you think back to when you started making that two hundred and fifty dollar advertisement decision 
was probably just as excruciating in some aspects as it is to make the level decisions now because you're proportional to your revenue or your lack of revenue at times. And so it, it makes it that decision kind of is always a tough decision to make and to ensure you get a return. Yeah, it's it, but that's the job. If you're in charge of your business, yeah. the job is to make sure that uh, you, you come up with a plan and you make that plan reality. And, and it's mm-hmm. Every everything that's going to be successful was planned that way. Anything mm-hmm. uh, that's unsuccessful was probably poorly planned that way, or was planned that. Way. Yeah, yeah, good, good example. Um, all right, listeners, we're going to go ahead and take a quick commercial break, and we come back. We'll get into some more advice from Daniel on you know being an entrepreneur, things you should consider, things that you know he kind of wished he knew when he was at different stages in his uh, successful career. So we're going to take that break and we'll be right back. Landmark Life Coaching's vision is to be the nation's premier coaching partner for inspiring and empowering those in transition. They partner with courageous groundbreakers and transitioning veterans to create fulfilling and empowering futures that they desire. They have partnered with various entrepreneurs and transitioning veterans to leverage their core strengths and implement the framework for the future they always dreamed of. Could you or anyone you know benefit from a success partner to bring clarity to your future or their future? If so, please check out LandmarkLifeCoaching.com for more information and CharlieMikePodcast.com for the Charlie Mike Podcast showcasing the successes of combat veteranpreneurs. Okay, we are back with Daniel Alark with Grunt Style. Um, he has been giving us an overview of his military career and how he transitioned out to become an entrepreneur and why he chose that path. And, you know, we were just discussing, you know, all the different things that he's had to consider in building the business and being able to reach the customer base that is his uh, direct uh, purchasers in the community. So, um, so Daniel, uh, as you were going through this, you know, obviously it alluded to before, there's a lot of learning and things like that. Are there any resources in particular that you just find the kind of the, you know, you need to know this as an entrepreneur that is available? Well, if you're coming out of the military, the biggest thing that the military doesn't teach you is how to sell something. There's there's just nowhere in the military at all where you do that. I mean, at best you maybe you go you go before a board, but I mean that's you're not selling anything anyway. I mean, yeah, you're selling yourself, but it's it's quite considerably different when you get out into the business world. So, learning how to sell is is a big resource and sometimes you just got to go out and learn how to do it. I mean, you can read a few books. There's some great books out there, but they won't make much sense to you until you get off your feet or uh, get off your butt and go out there and start selling something. And, you know, you can do that, you know, working for a tanning salon or selling cars. It doesn't matter. But getting out in front of people and figuring out how to connect with them uh, and, and and learning that whole process is very important. Yeah. Did you uh, did you go through any of the veteran boot camps um, as you were transitioning or – None. None. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That that's interesting because of the level of success that you've attained uh, with your with your various ventures. Um, a lot of a lot of guests have gone through you know some of the more commonly known uh, ones like Bunker Labs or the one at Syracuse University and such. University of Connecticut has one, and so they they've found those very very enlightening to learn some of the things that you've talked about. Uh, so. It's interesting that that you, that you haven't, and but yet are still very successful. That that's good for people to know that you know it, it just depends on your style, right? It depends on how you approach your business and things like that. Do you do you have anybody that you consider to be a mentor or coach that you've used? You know, I mean, you don't have to specifically name them if you don't want, but have you had like a mentor or a coach kind of person from a business perspective? Well, so when I first started off, um, I enrolled in a uh, business 101 class at a junior college, and my teacher was like, hey, if anyone's starting a business and they need mentorship, I'll be happy to help. Now, he wasn't a business owner himself, but you know he had decades, and he was an army vet back in the 50s, too. Uh, but uh, <laughs> I, I, I called it the Civil War. Because, you know. <laughs> anyway, um, he... Uh, he definitely helped me with a few things. You know, he, he wasn't an entrepreneur, so he had a lot of limitations, but just general business knowledge, it definitely helped. You know, he, he taught me things about inventory and some, and some sales ideas. Um, I also had a, uh, I was a personal trainer for a while. 
Um, and I was ranked uh, number one in Chicago, number 18th or something in the country uh, on the largest chain gym. But it's predominantly, you know, you're, you're selling yourself for personal training, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, but I learned a lot from uh, one of my buddies there. He showed me how to, how to sell. He had a he had a government background uh, with one of the agencies, and um, so we were con- we connected off of that. But um, he showed me, hey, this is this is how I sell, and he was a very A to B uh, type of person. So I learned a lot. That's interesting. Yeah, that's good because I think we all pick them up even informally, even if we don't know it. When we look back at our careers, we're like, oh, you know, I really did lean on that person quite a bit for information and and they played a significant role in in the success that that we have. And so, yeah, I I wholeheartedly, you know, kind of push for people to find those mentors and coaches to get, if nothing else, to get counsel from, right? Hey, I'm thinking about doing X. What do you think? And and to try to, you know, shortcut some of those uh, potential pitfalls. So, uh, absolutely. Yeah. What's some of the. If I make a recommendation when you're trying to find a mentor, and I see, I'm in a few entrepreneur circles uh, online and around, and I see people throw mentor or life coach around all the time. You have to be very, very careful when you find somebody. Um, is you they they must have the experience. It's absolutely crucial. There, are, everyone wants to give you advice. But make sure they have the experience to do so. That's very, very important. There's a lot of people who claim to be business as experts, and then you ask them, "Okay, what's your chops?" And they have, they don't have any. You know, it's, it's. Uh, I'm not going to teach you, uh, you know, how to be a special forces ranger, Delta sniper. If you know all of my experience is playing Halo and Call of Duty, it doesn't make sense. So make sure that you want something. You know, if a Navy SEAL comes to you and say, "Hey, listen, let me show you some uh, tricks that I learned in the." Uh, you know, when I was going through buds on how to do push-ups better. Okay, great. You know what? You got some experience. The that sounds like you're a professional in this. Not everyone's perfect, but you definitely want to make sure that someone's gone through those ropes, and that's really crucial. Yeah, that's that's a great point. Definitely, because there are many that will mentor, quote unquote, mentor and or coach that. Yeah, they've 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 read about it somewhere, and so now they want to take somebody else's. I've seen this all the time. They'll take somebody else's material and twist it some way to have the secret to <laughs> the next great venture and when you you know and then you wonder why you're not successful following it so that that's that's good information so as you guys are growing rapidly now i you know i i see you're getting into various areas um with you know expanding out from from grunt style uh what what's some of the the uh, big things you guys have coming up on the horizon or in the throes of now um, so one thing we're uh, doing is we're setting up our own cut and sew facility. Um, so we're going to uh, make American-made jeans, button-downs. We're working on American-made boots as well. We're really trying to become like, the American brand. And, you know, we're not, we're not chasing the Walmart bottom dollar. We're not going to be that super price competitive. But all, what we want to do is um, – bring back American quality and pride in our manufacturing. You go back 100 years or even 60 years ago, America was the standard in the world for for goods. We made the best goods in the world. They last forever. There you still see, you know, cast iron fridges and um, old machinery that lasts forever. Nowadays, you can buy a washing machine and in three years it's done. As soon as the warrant, you know, two days after the warranty expires, you know, that's just the way things work. So what we're doing, and this is why we do our beer guarantee, we guarantee everything for life. So if it does something does happen, you know, even your T-shirt, you know, we'll we'll exchange it. So what we're trying to do is, it, we're not too concerned about having the the hippest fashion. We don't care about that. What we care about is you look good, but you have a superior function and quality in it. So I want you to have the same coat that you want to wear in winter for the next five, six, seven, eight, ten years because it lasts that long and you love it and it works. And it doesn't need to be, you know, it doesn't need to have have bedazzled jewelry on it and flashing lights and Bluetooth. It just needs to be, hey, you know what? This is a great coat. It's warm. You know, it's got a concealed carry pocket in it for me. I'm happy with it. I'm going to wear it next year, too. Yeah, that's that's definitely what's missing in, in our markets. I can tell you that. Well, you know, one one not related to, you know, the veteran area, but, you know, L.O. Bean has something similar where, you know, they'll build a product. They've done it for years now. And one of their things, and I don't think people really realize it, is they literally have a lifetime guarantee on anything they've made. And they will literally take something that you've had for years and exchange it. 
Yep. And and people just don't realize that though, and so they, you know, it probably goes less um, utilized than than people realize. And so I'm a big fan of that. I'm like, this is amazing. Like you said, if I can buy a jacket and and I really like it, and I it's it's pretty much you know uh, the things that I would buy aren't trendy so it's not going to go out of quote unquote out of style so it's something i'll i'll continue to wear that's that's nice to know that you have that guarantee on it so that's that's great and i I love the fact that you guys are so focused on american made american quality bringing that back uh one thing i pride myself in is buying american made products um i think that's one of the one of the greatest things we can do to support our country is to buy those american made products and then for me it's a it's a it's a double you know great thing if it's veteran owned (laughs) veteran made veteran owned so that's that that's awesome so uh, thanks again for being on the show. As we're running out of time here, I wanted to give you a quick chance to uh, give our listeners um, your contact information, either for the business or yourself, if they want to learn more information. Absolutely. Uh, you know, obviously, you can go to gruntstyle.com to check us out. We have alphaoutpost.com. We're launching a uh, free fitness app here in about four weeks called Grunt Fit. Um, if you want to chat with me, you can reach out to me on my uh, either Twitter account, which is Daniel Alaric, or um, I have a Facebook page as well. Um, very responsive. Please, you know, just get all of us. If you uh, if you're a vet starting a business and you're hitting the wall, you know, I, I can't give you hours of my time, but I, my assistant knows that we have to guarantee every uh, vet who wants uh, help at least 20 minutes. Awesome. Well, thank you again for being on the show. And most importantly, thank you for your service to our country. All right. No, thank you. This is a fantastic show. Remember, loyal listeners, we are the home of the free because of the brave. Thank you for tuning in to Charlie Mike Podcast with Dwayne Perro. Our objective is to bring successful veterinarians to help inspire and provide insight into what helped them become successful with the hopes you can take away various strategies you can implement in your entrepreneurial journey. Visit us on iTunes, leave us a rating and review, and let us know what you thought of the show. Thank you for tuning in, and we'll see you next time. Oorah!